Hey everybody, this is Chris. Today I'm going to show you how to carve a wooden bowl. I basically did almost everything I thought I could possibly do to a bowl and then explain each step in excruciating detail using time-lapse video, close-up video, and voiceover. I'll be going over my tools, techniques, and most importantly, my thought processes so you can decide how far you want to go with your bowl. Here we go. I'm starting with a fairly fresh cut walnut log. All the details of this acquisition you can find in the video in the description section called the joys and perils of urban logging. But let's not get into that now. Sometimes you have to get creative when there's no one around to help you move big, heavy logs. The first tool I'm using is a cross-cut saw. You can see here is the pith. That's the center of the log where all the growth rings grow out from. You want to stay away from the pith because you get a lot of cracking in there. In fact, this is where it was splitting off and here's a second pith. Now we want to stay away from these. So I'm going to split it like this because I want to use this high curve part of the tree. In terms of safety equipment, I'll be wearing wrist straps, leather gloves, and safety glasses. Whenever I'm splitting a short log like this, I always get the split going on top and then I put a wedge on each side about halfway down. By striking the wedges on all three sides, I ensure a straight split. I think I better hurry up. Ooh. To prevent cracking, I quickly coat the ends with anchor seal. The next tool I'm using is a single bevel hatchet. Its chisel-like edge is helpful in removing the bark in one piece. I want the opening of the bowl to be in the shape of an ellipse. There's a link in the description section for a video on how to maximize the size of an ellipse in a set area. Now we're all set to start carving on my outdoor workbench. Now the grain goes in this direction. So if I start wailing on this with my ads, it could split and split all the way out. So I'm gonna chop out this ellipse very shallowly first to kind of break the grains around so it can't do that. A friend of mine is a blacksmith, and he made me an amazing adz from a garden mattock. I made the handle from hickory, and its three-quarter length enables very accurate strikes. The white edge just eats through the wood. and the long blade allows me to chop deep into the log. I'm gonna chisel around the edge versus using my adz because I don't wanna miss strike and ruin the lip. Now I'm gonna go around and try and even out the slope around the bowl before I cut it any deeper. Now that I've widened it out, I'm going to take somewhere out of the bottom. I'm going to use my large adz, but I'm going to come in at a flat angle from both sides and not hit the lip. Now I'm going to start curving the outside back in towards the bottom.
Here you can see in the time lapse, I'm matching the inside contour of the bowl to the outside contour. All right, I've done the initial rough in for the inside of the bowl, and I'm gonna start working on the outside. Just a quick note, this thing is always drying and always wants to crack. And so I've anchor sealed the entire outside and the ends. And then when I'm not working on it, I keep a moist towel on the inside to prevent cracking, especially on the end grain. Then I keep a plastic garbage bag over it. And that just keeps, uh, it, that just slows the drying process. Now you just have to be careful that you don't store it like this too long because the moisture will come out and you get mold. So I'm working on this basically every day or every other day if I can. All right, this bowl is 22 inches long. And so here's the center. And so off the center from the lip, I'm gonna come down three and a half inches. By the way, there's no science to this. It's just how I'm gonna make this work. 22 inches, half of that's 11. So I'm gonna cut this in half, five and a half inches. And five and a half inches. I'm gonna cut that in half to 2.75, 2.75, 2.75, 2.75. Now from the lip here, I'm gonna come down three inches at the first mark, then two and a half, two, then at the very top where this intersects, I'm gonna come over one inch to here, Alright, so the profile of the bowl, I want to look something like this. Come down a little more. So this is all coming off. This is all coming off. And then we want to take this down. So the bowl on the outside is going to have a slope like this. So this is going to come down here. I'm going to take all this off here and here. And so basically I'm going to slope, it's going to slope out this way along this line and then slope back down this way and end up being something like this. In the time lapse, you can see I'm just following the line to remove the excess wood. I've got this all roughed in, inside and out, with my ads, my chisels, and my axe. Now I'm going to take it inside and I'm gonna establish a flat bottom. Now you can see when I split this initially, there's some huge divots in here, huge divots. And so I'm gonna to have to basically take this down until the whole thing is flat. It's gonna be awesome. Before I flatten out the bottom, I wanna remove all the big divots. I made some extra long stanchions to help hold the bowl. I can screw them into the bowl if I need to. The leather helps me grip the bowl more securely. The spring-loaded buttons help me position it at the height that I need. I'm using a scrub plane with an extra wide throat and a curved blade to remove wood quickly. Now I'm going to start removing wood from the base, and I do this by going back and forth with my curved gouge. I'll also scrape and clean the bottom with this $2 tool I picked up at the flea market. As I take material out of the bottom, 
I'll also continue to contour the sides. You'll see in the time lapse I do several cycles of the gouge and the scraper. Okay, I've got the bottom roughed in. It's probably not quite the thickness that I want, but I'm close. I did a little bit on the sides. The bottom is roughed in. So now I'm gonna turn this over and work on the outside of it and kind of get the shape set the way I want. One thing I like to do is take a large flat chisel and turn the blade over and use it like a gouge. This way you end up with a flat surface versus a curved surface. Now I'm going to start working on the handles. Carving walnut is like carving chocolate. <laughs> it's amazing. Just like chocolate. I'm basically carving the outside of the bowl to match the angle on the inside of the bowl. I finish both handles and then I use a spoke shave to remove the tool marks. Gotta love the spoke shave. Up to this point, I've spent the majority of my time working on the darker heartwood. So I've flattened the bottom. I've evened out the sides. It's not perfectly symmetric, but that's okay. I put in the handles. And I finish the inside. Now I'm going to start working on the lighter sapwood. And so I'm going to be removing a bunch of the sapwood so I can have a narrow band of the darker heartwood on the inside and into the handle. And then a wider strip of sapwood and then back to the darker heartwood. There's still anchor seal all over the sapwood. So I'm going to use my draw knife and spoke shave to remove it all, exposing the virgin wood below. Okay, I'm done for the night, and I want to make sure there's not going to be any cracking. And where it's most likely to occur is in the end grain. So I'm going to wet down the ends here. Just put a little water on there. On the inside and the outside. Now I'm going to put these inside some paper bags. 
The paper is important because it will absorb the water coming out of the wood, but it won't end up sticking to the wood. And when the water gets on the wood, it ends up getting pretty nasty. And finally, I'm going to put it inside a garbage bag with holes in it, and that just slows everything down. There you go. In terms of what you should do if you get a crack in your bowl, you should panic. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I do panic, by the way, but um, you will get cracks occasionally in the end grain. And what you do is you get another piece of a matching wood, like this is cherry, you get another piece of cherry, you get a saw and create some fine sawdust. Uh, then you take super glue and you put it into the crack, which will penetrate and cut off the crack and keep it from cracking anymore. Then you rub the sawdust into it, which basically makes it match, and then you sand it down. And that's how you take care of cracks. So don't panic, but move quickly. Now I want to establish the dark ring on the inside. So before I get into any detailed carving on the sapwood, I'm going to do this first. You'll see in the time lapse I carefully remove the sapwood until the darker heartwood ring appears. Now I want to establish the dark heartwood on the outside edge. One of my most favorite tools is a slick. This is a huge chisel that's used uh, to make log cabins. Basically when you're turning trees into timbers, use a slick like this to knock off the big chunks. Uh, and this is the handle I made with the foot power lathe a couple years ago. I don't really need to use this for this application, but I just love using this. It's awesome. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> Now I'm using a tightly curved gouge to carve a deep channel between the sapwood and the heartwood. Now I'm going to continue to thin out the sapwood because eventually I'm going to be doing more carving into it and it's just too thick right now. I've worked on the bottom part of the sapwood and I'm going to start taking down the top side. And I continue to thin it out as well. I've evened up both sides of the sapwood, and now I'm going to start working on the handles. I'm just comparing these two sides. This one's already pretty symmetric and smooth. Now I'm trying to match this side to this side. All right, that's pretty even. So now I'm gonna go and get the depth right on the sapwood. So you can see it's pretty thick over here, thick here, thin here, thin here really thin there, so I'm going to take some material out around here so this is the same thickness of sapwood all the way around.
I'll clean up the rim as well. Now I'm going to do something called scalloping. I got this idea when I saw the ridges in the sapwood when I was carving it earlier. This is a great way to add more distinctiveness to the bowl. I gotta get this shot set up just right so I can have an awesome time lapse. As I'm scalloping, I also need to clean up all the tool marks I'm leaving. I finished the inside ring and the top of the sapwood. Now I'm going to keep going down and I'm going to finish the bottom of the sapwood. I really like this line here and this thickness, so I'm going to duplicate this on all four sides. You also note that the sapwood is wider on this side, so I'm going to even this up. Now that I'm getting into finer carving and the wood's a lot thinner, I can't clamp it as hard. So I have a board in the back and the front to keep it from slipping. And I can just slide it in and out easily. I've completed contour in the top half of the bowl. Now I'm going to remove wood just underneath this line here to make it more pronounced. I can see there's a nice sharp line there. Really makes this ridge stand out. Most of the major carving is done, except for the handles. Now these are the most delicate part of the bowl, so you always save those till last. With the handles complete, the only major bowl shaping left to do is to finish the bottom. And you always do that at the very end, because as the bowl dries, sometimes you can get some twist in it. So again, it's better to finish the bottom at the end. Now it's time to move on to the detailed carving of the sapwood. My wife specifically asked for Celtic designs, which are complex intertwined shapes. I decided to try something simple. The contrast between the heartwood and the sapwood looks amazing, but the sapwood's a real challenge to carve. I had to do a lot of cleanup on it. I think I'll try just a regular shamrock.
That was a total disaster. Uh, it looked horrible. I couldn't stand it. So actually my daughter came down and she helped me brainstorm how I could carve over the top of it. And I'm just going to call this a Celtic leaf. In this case, I'm changing it up. I'm carving into the walnut and the sapwood is bringing the contrast on the outside. I'm totally making this up, but that's a Celtic leaf growing out of a Celtic shamrock. At this point I decided to take a break from detailed carving, and moved on to scraping the bowl, removing as many tool marks as I could. The better job you do scraping, the less time you have to do sanding. I'm using just a simple curved panel scraper. That really makes a huge difference. Now all I need to do is some light sanding. At this point I had a real problem. I was going on vacation for a week and I was worried about leaving the bowl inside the bags. On one hand I had the risk of having mold. On the other hand if I left it outside the bags I could get cracking issues. So I decided to oil the bowl, which dramatically slows the drying process. The wood is really thirsty. So I like to put on gloves and really rub that oil deep into the fibers. It's very important when you're applying oil that you wipe it off completely. Otherwise when it cures you end up with a thicker film and it's very susceptible to scratching. I used Watco Danish Oil Natural Color, and it really made my self-proclaimed Celtic carvings look great. But it also exposed all the defects I'm going to have to go back, scrape the oil off of, and fix. Defects like tool marks, scratches, poor scraping, and fiber lift. So you should never apply oil to your bowl until you're completely finished. Otherwise you end up with a lot of extra work. So I put the bowl back in the bags and headed out on vacation. Again, with the oil applied, it dramatically slows the drying process, so I shouldn't get any mold buildup. It was time to complete the carving on the other side of the bowl. And this time I was a bit more organized, and I decided to try a combination of flowers and vines. And I'm making this up again, but they are Celtic flowers and vines. Now let's take a closer look at the carve. As I did much earlier in the project with my large flat chisel, I'm turning over this small flat chisel to get better control of the depth of each stroke. For this smaller carving detail, I have to use sandpaper to smooth out the petals. For the flower petals, I'm alternating between a convex and a concave surface. I'm using a small carving gouge to achieve the petal's concave shape.
The key with the vines was to make sure you ended up with a tightly curved surface. The perfect tool for this is called a bent back gouge. As I did with the leaf on the other side, I'm going to carve this flower into the walnut to change up the color contrast. I'm matching the outer sapwood surface to the petals to bring more focus to the flowers. Just one thing to remember when you're carving a channel that you're going to be removing wood. Make sure it's wider than your narrowest tool and then it makes it a lot easier to scrape it out with that narrower tool. I'll never win an award for carving, but I sure love doing it. I really want to highlight the carvings, so I'm going to start by gloss lacquering the inner ring of the bowl above the carving. Then I'm going to use a flat oil on the wood behind the carving. Then I'm going to gloss lacquer the carving itself. You can see here I went back to the center flower and carved the outer sapwood to match the petals. This really helps to highlight the flower. And finally I'm going to gloss lacquer the channel below the carving. This way I end up with both shiny and flat surfaces. The final bit of wood removal is to plane the bottom flat. Now I'm going to apply a second coat of oil to the bowl, but only to the surfaces that have not been carved on. In terms of what is the best oil for finishing your bowl, there's really many options. Like I said before, I used Watco Danish Oil Natural Color because it doesn't change the color of the wood. You never want to use a stain or anything that's going to cover up, you know, the beautiful cherry look or the spalted maple. So go for something that's light colored. There's tongue oil, there's boiled linseed oil, there's beeswax. Uh, and in all these cases, once they cure, they're food grade. Uh, you can also use butcher block oil, which is food grade. So there's many options. You can't go wrong. Now I want to spend a little time talking about how you dry your bowls out. Now there's many factors that impact drying. Uh, the type of wood you use, say cherry or maple, or how thick the wood is when you're done with it, or how much moisture was in it when you started. All these things are factors. But what I do, regardless of the type of wood, is I, I'm always keeping it inside paper bags and plastic bags until I'm completely done, until I've oiled the entire thing, and then I keep it inside just paper bags. And then I take a food scale and I weigh the bowl every day and I track that over time. And I don't want it to drive more than 1% in a day. In fact, this bowl, um, I worked on this off and on for about three months. So it, is, it was in and out of bags and drying slowly. So by the time I got the oil on, it's basically stable. But a week ago, this weighed 220 grams and, and this week it weighs 214. So about a gram a day is coming out. So a tenth of a percent, I mean very low amounts. So if you are drying your bowl and the, the moisture is coming out more than 1% a day, then you should put it back inside the plastic garbage bag and that will slow it down. 
So in all these cases, you really want to take your time. It can take, uh, based on how long you're working on the bowl, it can take days or weeks for it to reach a steady state. So again, what I do is I weigh the bowl every day and I track it over time. And once that starts to level out, it's a steady state and your bowl's dry. And then you can take it out of the paper bag and you're ready to go. I made sure to wipe it clean so there's no excess oil on the bowl. Well, the bowl is finally done. I hope you enjoyed this video. I enjoyed every minute in making this bowl. I spent about 40 hours on it, about half the time in the general shaping and half the time in the detailed carving. I appreciate your comments, your subscriptions, and for following me on Instagram or Twitter at Chop with Chris. Now comes the best part of the video. I get to present this to my lovely wife. Just stand right there. Just stand right there. Here's the bowl that I made to replace the other one that I auctioned off for charity, okay? This one's better. You think it's better? Oh, hell yeah. I was worried. Why do you think that? I don't know. I like these two tones. Now turn it around, you'll see the one Celtic drawing that I did. One. And a couple other weird things. Ooh, I like that. Celtic clover, and then I made... How'd that, why that leaf? Well, because I carved a three-leaf clover, which is okay. Then I carved a four-leaf clover, and it was awful. So I had to make it up, so I tried a leaf into the walnut, so it's a different tone. I kind of like that. It's nice and light. Very nice, thank you. I love you. That's why I carved this. Let's just look at this side, okay? I like this side better, because this is what I wanted. Okay, all right. But I still like this side. <laughs> well, hold on, hold on, you stand there. I like this side okay. better, because I wanted the Celtic stuff. This, these are Celtic flowers and vines. They are, it's Celtic and it's symmetric. Awesome. What? But I, I like this side better. Okay, here, you can have that side and I'll have this side. I kind of like this side better though. Whose bowl is it? It's your bowl. Well, I did some different decoration techniques to make, make different something. things stand out. So yeah. I lacquered the outside parts and the carved parts and I left flat the other parts. So it kind of gives it a two-tone look. I mean, the walnut, this is sapwood and heartwood, but I also changed the way I decorated it to get different but looks. Yeah. Yeah, it ends up looking it, a little silver. In different, yeah, in different lights. I, I, it's I, inten silver. I intended that. I like that. It's really pretty. Thank you, honey. You're welcome.